Hello and welcome. I'm Carol Cram, your host for the Art and Fiction Podcast. This episode is called Viva Italia and features my interview with Laura Morelli, the author of three arts-inspired novels listed on Art in Fiction. Laura Morelli earned a PhD in art history from Yale University and has taught college students across the United States and in Italy. She now teaches exclusively online. Laura's historical fiction has earned numerous awards, as well as reviews in such publications as Writer's Digest, Publishers Weekly, and Library Journal. Laura loves art, history, and Italy, three things we definitely have in common. Welcome to the Art and Fiction Podcast, Laura. Hi, Carol. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. I've been a fan of your work since I read The Gondola Maker a few years ago now. Thank you. Long before I started Art and Fiction. Yeah, it was great. Well, it's set in Venice. I mean, we'll talk about it more in in a little while. But you have three novels uh, listed on the site at the moment. The Gondola Maker, The Painter's Apprentice, and The Giant, which was just released. I'm so excited to chat with you today. We have so many interests in common, particularly a love of art and of Italy. So I want to start by talking about The Giant, which, by the way, has such a marvelous cover. Thank you. Yeah, it has a very golden kind of aura around it. I was really happy with the color. You must have been. It really uh, kind of sums up Florence, I think. It's perfect. It's one of the nicest covers I've seen in historical fiction. Thank you. Now, the novel revolves around the sculpting of Michelangelo's David, as seen from the point of view of Jacopo Torni, Michelangelo's childhood friend and also a painter, a fresco painter himself. So can you tell us a little bit about why you wrote The Giant? Yeah, so The Giant it is um, a book that was uh, 20 years in the making, which is kind of crazy. But I started out with a book proposal for a book about Michelangelo's David, and it was intended to be a nonfiction tale. The true story of the making and unveiling of this world's most famous sculpture is kind of incredible in and of itself. And the 500th anniversary of the unveiling of Michelangelo's David was coming up in 2004. And so I wrote a book proposal for it, sent it to my agent. We shopped it around to some publishers and one of the publishers got right back to us and said, this is a great idea, great book. Unfortunately, um, someone else got to it before you did. (laughs) Darn. I hate that. (laughs) That happens. But, you know, um, it's a book by Anton Jill that's called Il Gigante that's about Michelangelo's David. And it's a great book. But I think the topic was ripe in 2004 since it was the 500th anniversary. So I said, well, that's fine. No problem. I put the book away. Um, I put the proposal away, started working on other projects. And years later, I pulled it out and I thought, you know, this is such an incredible story. And it was just a story and a, and a work of art that kind of wouldn't let me go. It kept coming back to me. I kept thinking about it. I kept thinking, I, I want to do something with this story because it, it is so compelling. And at that point, I was an art historian, PhD in art history, teaching at the college level, telling the story over and over to my students, uh, living in Italy for a while, you know, standing in front of the sculpture myself. And again, it was just a story that wouldn't let me go. It was after I turned to historical fiction that I said, ah, this story is supposed to be a novel. And it was at that point that it all came together for me. In the course of my research on the David, I came across a figure named Jacopo Torni. He was a real person. He was by all contemporary accounts, a friend of Michelangelo. And what we know very little about him, we know just a few facts, which actually makes him a perfect protagonist for a historical novel, because we know just a little bit, but not a lot. And so he's tantalizing, because what we're told by Giorgio Vasari, who's this 16th century art historian, is that Jacopo Torni was Michelangelo's closest friend, that he was lazy, that he liked to play practical 
jokes, that he was a pretty good painter himself, but it was hard to get him to, to get to work or finish anything. So, you know, he comes across as this kind of practical jokester, sidekick character. And we know that Michelangelo hired him as part of his team to work on the Sistine ceiling. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what an interesting um, kind of friendship they must have had because Michelangelo, by all accounts, was this more kind of serious and intense personality. And I wondered what it would have been like, this push and pull of these two seeming opposite characters together in the creation of two of the most pivotal works in the history of art, Michelangelo's David and the Sistine Chapel. I mean, my goodness. Yes. And so that was really kind of what set me down the path of writing this book. And um, it was a difficult book to write. You know, it's actually difficult to write things that are to, to, to get yourself in the mindset of humor in the past. You know, that was something that I really grappled with. Um, it was fun and it was also a big challenge to write about. Because one of the things I really enjoyed uh about the giant was how you get inside Jacopo's head. As you said, you know, he's a bit of a ne'er-do-well. He was had a pretty severe gambling problem. So kind of a manic depressive, wasn't he? Or you portray him as a manic depressive. You know, he, he is either up for four days or he's sleeping for four days. Can you talk about how you decided to portray Jacopo? Yeah, so there's a very interesting anecdote in Giorgio Vasari's um, biography of Michelangelo that describes the fact that Jacopo was ever by Michelangelo's side, making him laugh. And yet he describes a really funny incident about how Michelangelo gets fed up with him, sends him out to the market to buy figs. And while Jacopo is gone to buy figs, Michelangelo actually locks him out of his house. So when he comes back, he realizes that, it, that he's the one who's been the butt of the joke and he spreads the figs all around the doorway and yells and stamps off. And just this little paragraph and it, and it brings to life this what must have been kind of a torturous relationship or a relationship perhaps of frenemies. And so I wanted to kind of capture that a little bit. But I also find it interesting to imagine how people in past centuries dealt with things like mental illness, like addiction, like disease. Um, you know, I've written quite a bit about the Black Death and the plague. I mean, I think it's fascinating to imagine how people in pre-modern cultures dealt with these kinds of challenges, um, you know, pandemics, mental illnesses. And so it was just kind of my own kind of working through that and fascination with it that, I, you know, I decided to try to take this aspect, this little tantalizing story that we had about Jacopo and, and see how far we could take him in this story. Well, and that's why the novel works so well, because Jacopo is a full person you know, he's got his brother and his sister, and uh, he has all these problems. He also has a severe lack of confidence, which I think we can relate to, particularly when one of your friends is Michelangelo, and you're an artist too. <laughs> so you really explored that very well. Well, thank you. I, I think anyone who writes or paints or creates faces comparisonitis at some point. I mean, it's just part of the human condition. And just imagine if your closest friend was Michelangelo. <laughs> That's right. Or, or as a writer, your closest friend is Shakespeare. I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. You'd never exactly. write a word. And I think that's something that, that we as human beings can relate to in any century. Well, and that's why the, the book works and why historical fiction is just so much fun, because you can get into the skin of a person and you still get the story of how Michelangelo's David was created, but through this wonderful lens. Now, the other thing I want to talk about was, of course, the setting for the novel is Florence in the early 1500s. You do a really wonderful job of bringing to life the sights and particularly the smells <laughs> of the city. When you are researching, how do you kind of get yourself back into the Renaissance mindset when you're walking through streets now that are it's like the Renaissance Disneyland? Well, you know, the good news is that Florence specifically um, is, it still retains a lot of its character from the 16th century. Um, you know, if you look back, there's a famous map called the Carta della Catena, which is a, a historic map that shows what Florence was like in the days of Michelangelo. And looking at that map, it's sort of a bird's eye view, and it really doesn't look that different today than it did in that map. The skyline of Florence is still 
dominated by the great egg-shaped uh, red tile Duomo in the center and some of the other churches, you know, still sort of dominate the skyline. And so it's not very difficult, I think, if we look beyond the, the storefronts of Gucci and Ferragamo <laughs> and some of the other international luxury brands, it's not difficult to kind of make that leap and imagine ourselves uh, going down through the streets of Florence, particularly in the Oltrarno district on the, the south side of the Arno, where today there's still a lot of artisans practicing their their age-old trades of leather working and and woodworking and frame making and paper making and book binding and all of those things that would have been going on in Michelangelo's day as well. I spent quite a bit of time in Florence this last fall walking a lot of Michelangelo's itineraries. Um, he grew up near the Church of Santo Spirito. That's where he's buried. His house is still standing. I worked on a, an audio tour and I worked on that itinerary. I walked the route of the unveiling of the statue. Oh, wonderful. I really tried to immerse myself in that world and in his footsteps. And it, it helped a lot, I think, to kind of bring those sights and smells and sounds to life. Yes, well, you do it extremely well. You really feel like you're in Florence at that time. Now, the descriptions of Michelangelo's David are just stunning. I had to go and look at the pictures again just to remind myself of how wonderful a sculpture it is. So you've mentioned earlier you have a background as an art historian. So can you talk about how you made that transition from academia to becoming a novelist? Well, you know, I wanted to be an author when I was, I mean, as long as I can remember. I used to staple pages together when I was a kid, drawing pictures and writing stories. And when people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I always said I wanted to be a writer or an, and an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm actually um, very grateful that I ended up doing more or less what I set out to do when I was four years old. But, you know, when I was in college, I got really interested in art history and pursued um, a graduate degree. But I, as much as I respect the, uh, the academic writing conventions and I respect all of the hard work that my colleagues in art history do, I felt a little constrained by the, the strictures of academic writing. And although I love the research, there was this creative impulse that still needed to, um, to be expressed. And so when I turned to writing historical fiction uh, based on the stories of the history of art, I, I really felt like that was my true calling. That was really what I was supposed to do, was to kind of marry the two. And um, so it's really been a labor of love for me. Like I said, I love the research and I still do a lot of academic research. I get a lot of great ideas from footnotes and scholarly studies. I mean, that's about as geeky as, as it gets, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there's there's nothing better than a university library. I, I write historical fiction as well, and I just love going into them, just the smell of them. And yeah, footnotes are great. What would we do without them? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I found as a historical novelist, I actually felt freer than if I was an academic and had to footnote every single word practically. It, I mean, you know, you, you want to make sure you get it right, but yeah, you have more flexibility. So I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I mean... It's interesting because I think historical fiction readers come to the genre because they want to learn something, but they also want to immerse themselves in the past and really feel what it was like in a certain time and place. And so I find that the historical research is, is also really important to the reader. Oh, yes. When I visit big book clubs, they want to know, you know, did this really happen or did that, you know, what was that really like? And so I, I feel that my academic background allows me to have a firm framework to pin things on, to pin the events and the setting on. And there is always uh, a lot of information and there's a lot that we do know. And I try to, to use what we do know, the, the primary sources, you know, as, as that framework. But at a certain point, those pieces of historical evidence only take you so far. And it's the stuff that we don't know that I think is really compelling to us as novelists, right? So That's right. I can almost feel it when I'm departing from the dock, you know, of, of what we do know out into the ocean of what we don't. And it's, you know, you kind of feel it where, where the fact ends and the, the fiction begins. And that for me is just such a fun process to put that together. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, your other two novels, also set in Italy, are The Gondola Maker and The Painter's Apprentice. Both take place in Venice, which is one of my very favorite places in the world. Mine too. I bet, yeah. I was fascinated by all the detail in you had in The Gondola Maker for how gondolas were made. So how did you do that research? Well, I had written a book called Made in Italy. The first edition was published back in the early 2000s. It's now, gosh, I'm really dating myself, but it's um, the book has been out for 20 years now. It's in its third edition. And I spent a lot of time interviewing uh, Italian artisans, people making things like not only Venetian gondolas, but um, pottery and wood and all kinds of things that you think of when you think of Made in Italy. And it was that research that I did for for this nonfiction project that really became the underpinning for the novel, The Gondola Maker. Um, You know, as I traveled across Italy from north to south and interviewed artisans in many different trades, I heard a consistent story, which was our job is to pass on our trade to our children and our grandchildren so that our trade will stay alive. We have to pass the torch of tradition. And after I heard this story so many times, I began to wonder what would happen if the heir, a parent, was not willing or able for some reason to carry on that torch. And so the story of the gondola maker and his heir and their complicated relationship kind of bubbled to the surface. And um, that became the, as I said, that, you know, kind of the end of the of the nonfiction and the beginning of the made up part that was uh, really, really fun to write. Yes, because again, that's that's what you're doing very well is you're taking the history and then putting on a human story that could take place in any time. It's about humanity, you know, the father wanting to pass on his trade to the son or in the giant Jacopo wanting to take care of his sister. These are all human endeavors that we all know about and recognize. And I think, yeah, that's the fun of historical fiction is marrying those two. Absolutely. And of course, in The Painter's Apprentice, the plague plays a huge role. Tell me how it drives the narrative. Venice was really at in the crosshairs of the Black Death many times over the centuries um, in the days before antibiotics. And, you know, in fact, the word quarantine has a Venetian, a, a root, its roots in the Venetian dialect because a quarantena is a period of 40 days. And that's how long the Venetian authorities figured was, <laughs> was a good spell, long enough to figure out if someone was contagious or not. So they would quarantine ships that were coming into the Venetian lagoon to make sure that no one was sick before they came ashore. But certainly plague was a reality, a harsh reality in pre-modern Venice. And um, we know that it took the lives of several important Venetian painters during the Renaissance. And so that was sort of the spark of an idea there. And as I said, I'm, I'm always fascinated about how pre-modern cultures dealt with big challenges like this. But certainly it plays a very personal role in the life of the protagonist, Maria, who is the daughter of a gilder, um, meaning someone whose job it is to put gold leaf on paintings and frames. Um, The Venetians loved things that were gilded uh, during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And so Maria is the daughter of a of a gilder and she, as gold is starting to go out of fashion, she is apprenticed to a painter. And so the plague comes in and plays a personal role in in her life in this story. Of course, it's very relevant today because now suddenly we're plunged back into that, you know, reality, uh, quite a bit cleaner times, but still we are still experiencing it for the first time, which is kind of unprecedented. It really is. I wrote a story called Little Bird that takes place during the Black Death of 1348 in Siena, and um, it was published as part of an anthology of historical fiction about the plague. And it just so happens that the um, the uh, one of the other authors who was coordinating this anthology pressed publish on March first, twenty twenty. Oh my goodness! <laughs> of course, we had you know been working on this anthology for months beforehand, and it was just such a bizarre 
thing that the book published on March 1st. <laughs> That's amazing. If you want to check it out, it's called We All Fall Down. And um, it is a collection of stories from the Middle Ages through the 20th century about um, pandemics. So some people are loving reading about that right now. And some people don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole, which I can understand. Well, I understand that personally, because my first novel takes place in the 1340s in San Gimignano and Siena. So of course, the plague definitely plays a role. And it was funny, I was working on the sequel when the pandemic hit. And I thought, you know, I just don't want to hang out in the 14th century right now. Right. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. So I actually put it aside for now and started working on something else. But it's it's interesting how it will change how we write. I, I don't know if it'll change how we write, but it certainly is going to have an effect that we don't even know. Yeah, well, you know, I I don't think that people in our generation have faced something of this scale, um, this epic scale in our lifetimes. You know, our, our grandparents maybe were swept up in World War II in whatever way. But, um, you know, we've never, many of us have never experienced anything like this. So I think so too. I think it will be interesting to see how it impacts those of us who write or paint or create music. Uh, it'll be interesting to look back at this time and see and understand what the impact has been. Time for a short break. Are you interested in creating a podcast? If so, then check out Buzzsprout. You'll find a ton of information about how to start and run a podcast, and you'll get your podcast listed in every major podcast platform. When I decided to start the Art and Fiction podcast, I needed help, and I found it with Buzzsprout. You'll learn everything you need to know to start a podcast and then get it out into the world. When you're ready to start your own podcast, Follow the link in the show notes and you'll receive a $20 Amazon gift card when you sign up for a paid plan. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. And now, back to the podcast. They asked if you'd like to do a short reading, so would you like to do a reading from The Giant? Sure. I'll read the first page of The Giant. It's a very short passage, and it just, I think, sets up the relationship between Jacopo and Michelangelo. So hopefully it'll leave you wanting to read more. I hope so. Well, I've already read it because I I thought it was wonderful. (laughs) Okay, go for it. It began on the day our hands reached for the same silver point pen. In the dust-filled light of our master's workshop, I saw his fingers first, short and slight, with knuckles too large for a ten-year-old boy. He gripped the bone stylus. I gripped it, too, as hard as I could. The metal tip trembled in the air. My first thought was that my wide, thick fist would win out over his smaller hand, but when our gaze met, I saw only beady black eyes filled with fire. I let go of my grip. I hardly had time to console myself with the idea that I had let him have the pen, for our master announced a competition to see who could draw the best rendition of a Moses in silver point. We boys wanted nothing other than to please our master. We darted to our places in the workshop, and each of us began to work as grains shifted noiselessly inside the sand glass. I watched him, that black-eyed boy. He slunk off to a dusty corner and hunched over his parchment so that no one could see what he had drawn. When the time was called, our master circulated quietly among his pupils. Then he pulled the two of us by our sleeves to the front of the room, declaring a tie. That moment changed everything. We were friends. At least I thought we were then. But in my heart, I still wanted to beat that boy. That's a wonderful setup for what then becomes this relationship that you explore in the novel. Thank you. That was great. That took me right back to reading it. Now, I wanted to also talk about uh, some of the other things that you do in addition to being a novelist. Uh, You have a wonderful website, and I notice you have a lot of travel books. I'll make sure I put the address of the website in the show notes. But uh, tell us a little bit about your wonderful shopping guides. I I do some travel writing myself. I have a, 
our website for travel writing. So I really enjoyed looking through your guides. Can you tell us how you came to write them? Well, I was living in Italy at the time, and I had just finished my PhD, and I was excited to be living in Italy and go out and look at, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper and all of these masterpieces that were in my art history books. But I found myself living in a small village, and um, there were no Leonardo da Vinci's. There were no Caravaggio's in my village church. Instead, the village was filled with little artisans, like there was a cello maker and a shoemaker and another maker of wonderful artisanal cheeses. And then I hired some carpenters to make some bookshelves for my house. And I thought, oh, well, they'll just come, you know, in a couple of days and bring me some shelves. Well, no, they just didn't show for a long time. And I called them and called and they said, um, Signora, siamo pochi, ma buoni ma'am, we're few, but we're good, which meant I just had to wait. So ultimately, they did appear. Um, This truck pulled up in front of my house, and I thought, oh, great, my bookshelves are here. Well, instead, it was just a pile of lumber along with a three-man team composed of a grandfather, a father, and a son. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, these three guys transformed the courtyard outside my house into an artisan workshop. And I was absolutely riveted watching what they did. Not only was the final result incredibly beautiful, but it was so fascinating to see how they worked as a multi-generational team. And I could really see that transmission of knowledge. You know, the the son was the workhorse bringing in all the lumber. You know, the father sort of stood there and berated him, yelled at him all day to do it right. And then at the end of the day, the grandfather, who spent most of his day sitting outside in the courtyard smoking cigarettes, would just kind of come in at the end. And he was quality control. And he would tamp on the wood and check this and check that. And I thought, wow, this is really how it's worked for centuries, you know, that this one generation is teaching the next. And I thought, that's a living tradition. It was nothing that I was going to find in my art history books. It had nothing to do with, you know, any of the the works that I had studied for all of these years. And when my eyes were open to it, I started to realize that these artisans were everywhere in Italy and that no one had really paid any attention to them. And I thought for a traveler to Italy to be able to witness that and discover it and understand the history and to be able to go home with something authentic in your suitcase is a, it's a fantastic immersive travel experience. And so I wrote this book called Made in Italy. Since then, I've written some smaller guides made in Venice, made in Florence, and made in Naples and the Amalfi Coast that lead travelers off the beaten path to come home with little treasures in their suitcase. They, they look just wonderful. Now, Italy is fantastic. It, it was so tragic this year that we couldn't go back, but next year we hope to go. <laughs> Hopefully very soon. <laughs> yes. And also on your website, I was fascinated to see your Art History Academy. My goodness, you've got so many amazing courses, the art of Michelangelo, the art of Raphael, etc., And I noticed you even have wait lists for most of the courses. Can you tell us a little bit about those courses? Yeah, well, this is something I'm super excited about because there are a lot of people out there who love art history and want to learn, but they don't necessarily want to be in a classroom environment anymore. You know, I have a lot of students who are well past college age, who aren't interested in taking exams or writing papers, and yet they love art history. They want to travel virtually. They want to continue their self-enrichment and education in art history. So I've started putting a lot of my college courses online. And the first one I put online is about the art of the ancient Etruscans. And I thought, well, this is such an incredibly esoteric topic. I'm probably one of 10 people in the entire world who are going to be excited about this class. And I put it up and I was absolutely blown away at the response. People were so excited to learn about the ancient Etruscans. And I just couldn't believe how popular it's been. And so since then, I've added some more classes. And, and I love it because 
you know, the students are there because they are excited to learn and they ask great questions and they really challenge me to go back and read things that I had or see things in a way that I hadn't seen before. So it's just all fun. The internet has provided such a great platform to be able to reach people um, who can access them anywhere, anytime, at their own pace. I have a lot of people who are older who maybe are not able to travel anymore or, you know, uh, not able to, to, to go where they want to go. They tell me that it's been a wonderful opportunity for them and it's, it's just been a lot of fun for me too. Well, it's very inspiring. I, I'm going to look more closely at your courses because, I mean, you're doing also something that is very close to my heart is I'm, I'm not a teacher of art, but I certainly love art and, and want to write about it a lot, particularly in the context of Europe. Thank you. Now, I also wanted to talk a little bit about writing in general. So, like, how do you develop a novel? I know that's a very big question, but just, you know, yeah, a sort of little overview of the process you go through to get started on a novel? So I think there are probably as many ways to get a novel done as there are people, you know, as there are writers. It seems, you know, that it's a very individual process. Personally, I'm a big, I'm a huge outliner. Mm -hmm. um, I know other people who don't, you know, who just literally start with a blank page and start writing. I, I'm a big, I'm a very analytical person. I start with a fairly fleshed out outline. And, um, you know, I know who, I know where I'm starting, I know who the characters are, and I know where I want to go. But within that, you know, it never follows the outline 100%. You know, no. I always um, take detours and, and things end up a little differently than I thought. But I do start out with a kind of a basic structure and basic idea of, you know, where it's going. I like to go through a lot of drafts. I like to have time to put a manuscript away for a while and come back to it with fresh eyes. Um, I know some people like to type the end and then send it right out, but I really mm -hmm. find that personally, I like to have that time to put something away and come back to it. I have a couple of wonderful uh, first readers, early readers, and a wonderful editor, and I always really think carefully about their feedback. And then the publishing process is a whole can of worms, is a whole different topic. <laughs> there are a lot of different paths to publication as, just as well as there are different ways of, of writing. Yes, do you have any advice about uh, publishing for new writers? Well, you know, I think that you will want to decide whether you want to pursue traditional publishing or publish independently. They are two kind of different paths, but certainly I think these days there's a lot more overlap and a lot more people pursuing both or mm -hmm. pursuing some kind of hybrid. Um, I have, for example, this year in 2020, I have The Giant that's just come out that I published independently. And then in September, I have another historical novel called The Night Portrait that's being published by HarperCollins. Um, so it was a traditional deal. So it's they're very different ways of bringing a book to market. They each have their pros and cons. <laughs> Definitely. And there's no, there's no one right way or there's no one best way. It depends very much on the, the author and what you are willing to do, able to do, and excited to do, I guess I would say. Well, I think the thing that I like about the atmosphere now for writing is that we have choice. I'm a hybrid as well. I've, I've published yeah. Yeah. both ways totally I, I totally agree I mean I it's we live in such an incredibly wonderful time in terms of having choices and opportunities that we never had before so it's a great time to be publishing it, it is and actually I didn't know that uh, the giant was independently published so that means of course you're doing a lot of your marketing I think we have to market no matter what but any tips about marketing for people who choose to publish themselves or even if they do it traditionally? Yeah, well, I think the bottom line is either way, um, the marketing is on you. Yes, <laughs> that's primarily. True. 
That, that was true. a bit of a shock to discover that, yes. Yeah, it is true. And that is, was true before as well. I mean, I published uh, traditionally with Rizzoli for my nonfiction books, um, you know, back in the early 2000s before independent publishing was an option. Um, and then as well, you know, a lot of the marketing is up to the author. It can be a ton of work, mm -hmm. um, but you know, things have changed rapidly and they continue to change. So I would advise any new writer who is wondering what to do marketing wise to really start listening to podcasts and um, reading widely about what's happening because the landscape is changing. It changes very rapidly in terms of what's working today versus what's working tomorrow. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, Having said that, that really pertains to, you know, specific marketing tactics or advertising or whatever. But the basic tenet remains the same, which is these days you want to just reach the reader directly. And, you know, we never had that opportunity before the Internet. Our books would show up in, in bookstores and we had no direct access to our reader. I mean, today you just want to reach your reader directly, whether that is through your own social media, whether that is through advertising on Amazon or Facebook or BookBub, um, whether that is going to your local literary festival and sitting in a booth or speaking at a you know local organization you really want to figure out where your readers are and and reach them directly that's that's kind of the, the general idea so I presume you do all of those things in order to connect with your readers I do I've tried all kinds of different things I just think it's fabulous to have a community of readers and, you know, get your mailing list in place if you don't have it there already. I primarily communicate with my readers via my mailing list. And you have to remember that as wonderful as Amazon and Facebook and, you know, these large platforms are, they, they don't belong to us. So no. we, we only control our, our own communications through our own list. So anyone who's looking to publish and reach their readers, you know, you're going to want to incentivize them to join you on your email list above all. Yes, and I see that you do that by offering a free story on your website, which I think is, is very smart. It's worked out well, actually. It's, um, it's really helped to bring in the, the readers who are interested in, in the type of work that I write. So I recommend it. Yes, I, I think I'm going to um, borrow that idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to end off by talking a little bit about your new novel, The Night Portrait, which is due out in September. And I see that it's a dual time novel set in the Renaissance in Italy and in World War II. So you can tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so The Night Portrait is about the portrait of the lady with the ermine by Leonardo da Vinci. If yes, you Google I know it, it, you'll say, oh yeah, I it's know that gorgeous. picture. <laughs> yes. It's a picture of a beautiful young woman holding a, a white creature in her lap that looks something like a ferret. And um, the, the woman in the painting is generally believed to be the 16-year-old pregnant mistress of the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza. Yeah, who, who and, was not a very nice guy, was he? No, he was a, he was a rather ruthless dude. And <laughs> so she was an object of desire in the 15th century. And that was the reason why the Duke, you know, hired Leonardo da Vinci to paint her. But what's really fascinating about this portrait is that it became an object of desire and obsession again in the 20th century. And it fell into the hands of Hans Frank, who later became known as the Butcher of Poland, um, another ruthless dude. This time he was Hitler's governor in Nazi-occupied Poland. And when he was captured by the Allies in 1945, this portrait of Cecilia Gallerani, Leonardo da Vinci's subject, was one of the last things in his personal possession. And so um, it fascinated me to think about this work of art being an object of desire over a period of 500 years and, and having traveled all over. I mean, in this picture, you won't believe where it went and <laughs> how many wow. places it ended up over those 500 years. I mean, it's truly a miracle that it survived at all. My goal with this book was really to make this picture at the center, at the heart of the story. And it goes 
goes back and forth between the creation of the portrait and then its theft in the 20th century. And um, it, again, is one of these incredible true stories where fiction just sort of fills in the gaps of what's already an, an amazing true story. Well, fantastic. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that when it comes out. It'll definitely be listed on Art and Fiction. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, one of the characters in the book is one of the Monuments men, and I was fortunate enough to to bend the ear of Robert Edsel, who's the founder of the Monuments Men Foundation, and he helped me with a Q&A at the end of the book that's really fascinating in and of itself. So anyone who's interested in that whole history of, you know, Nazi art theft and then the recovery of those works of art after World War II will want to pick up the book to read the Q&A because it's, it's very interesting. Oh, that's fascinating that you got to talk to them. Don't you love interacting with experts? Oh, I found yeah. them so helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining me, Laura. This has just been a fabulous conversation. Well, thank you for having me. I really have enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Art and Fiction podcast. Please check the show notes for links and be sure to visit Art and Fiction at www.artandfiction.com to find your next great read. While you're there, consider subscribing to Art and Fiction so you can receive the weekly update that gives you a sneak peek about the novel of the week, upcoming podcast episodes, featured reviews, blog posts and authors, and much more. And please follow Art and Fiction on Twitter and Facebook and consider giving the Art and Fiction podcast a positive review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for listening.